can already hear my voice is a little bit going, but I'm still here. <laughs> we want to talk about growing startups. And I ask you, everybody gets a couple of minutes, tell me a little bit from the first day until where you are now and how you really managed and what were the big challenges for you guys. <clears throat> okay. Florian. Um, yeah, we started in 2012. Actually, we started in 2011. Um, and formerly, I was involved in a B2B portal that sold inventory, PV modules, and, and inverters to um, wholesalers, installers, manufacturers. And when we approached utilities, they were like, don't get me modules. We need a business model. So try and get us a business model with which we can sell entire systems to end customers. And that was actually the idea um, of founding Greenergetic, which is similar to what uh, some American companies are already doing, or were already doing back in 2011. Um, basically, the idea is to have an online portal through which end customers can very uh, easily buy their PV system. And in order to save some money on marketing and stuff, we decided to provide this as a white label solution to um, utilities. And by means of using this, this online portal, utilities can, at the end of the day, sell PV systems to end customers and small residential, uh, sorry, um, small commercial and residential customers um, with no hassle on their side. Because if you know what a utility looks like, it's a huge company, many people involved, but getting processes and everything established within this company uh, is a pretty pain in the butt. So um, they are happy to have this business model outsourced and just have someone doing it for them. So it's not only the portal itself, it's also we do all the sales and, and um, operations. <coughs> Did they take you seriously from the beginning when you were a small no. startup? <laughs> in fact, they, yeah. I mean, depends. <coughs> the, first, the first portal we sold just on a, uh, with a slide deck, we didn't have anything there. And they were like, that's great, we buy it. Um, and then when we delivered the actual portal and it worked, there were even more uh, utilities coming. And to be honest, back in 2012, it wasn't too common um, that the future energy world be, will be full of startups and stuff. So um, three, four years ago, I think the whole utility landscape was a bit more like, well, there will be change, but actually we don't see that so much and stuff. And now it's much more urgent. And um, so we found out that the more we sold, the more relevant, relevant uh, we became. And today, I think it's pretty common that you sell PV systems to your end customers. Mm -hmm. So in a way, uh, we changed the perception of um, the self-perception uh, perception of some of the utilities. Okay. So that did work. Yeah, just Thomas? one question, ah, if I okay. may. So what do you think is the, the typical life cycle of a project with a utility coming from a startup? from first contact to the pilot project? What do you, what do you say? Typical is difficult because it's, it's such a wide span. Um, the fastest one uh, was just two weeks. So they were like, we need that. We want this. We need this. And in two weeks, there is a trade fair. So we want to present this. Uh, and we are able to, to move very fast. But the reality is that from the time that you have a meeting with the CEO or whoever in this, uh, in this uh, utility, and the actual execution of the portal, it can be anything between two weeks and two years. We have companies that took like two years to <coughs> decide whether they want to enter into this business and stuff. It's, I mean, it's utilities. Um, they have a yeah. Don't take longer, it longer lead time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we saw they, the they have many advantages, <coughs> but being fast is not right. the first I think, I mean, I mean, we saw the same thing at Taro, yeah. but, um, working with the, with the large utilities, other corporates. And I think it's just really important that there's a huge opportunity in, in revenue that comes very early for the startup in order for um, yeah, them to actually commit the resources for the first project yeah. um, and then, then do it, because otherwise they'll just be uh, completely, um, you know, break out, yeah, essentially. Thomas, how did you start uh, this incredible company and what were you, the big challenges you were facing during the last couple of years to grow from one founder to a group of how many are you now? Uh, actually, two founders to 500 uh, okay. people. Uh, it started at uh, a 5 a.m. breakfast together with the other founder. And um, I was working in Egypt by that time. 
and he mentioned this combination of solar and mobile money and bring the, the solar revolution from Germany towards the um, developing world. And um, yeah, that was pretty exciting for me. It's uh, 1.5 billion people in the world who are not connected to the grid. It's another 1.5 billion people who are connected to the grid, but there's no juice coming out. So it's half of the world population is um, affected by not having access to electricity. And I thought, well, if, if Mobisol could actually build a product service around that and provide a solution for three billion people, that would be pretty cool. Um, challenges, um, we were always very short on cash, but I think that was, if you're short on cash, you have to be creative. And um, I think that was, we made the challenge into our uh, innovative uh, advantage. So um, we looked at every euro twice before we spend it. Um, at some point, all of our colleagues were a member of the KLM Golf Club because you can travel with one more um, bag towards uh, Africa. So that bag was full with electronics or um, other stuff which we needed. And um, I think looking at growth, uh, I just came back today in the morning from Tanzania where we are opening our big new headquarters, which will be too small when we are moving in. So oh, it's, wow. it's, it's a, a constant, um, you have to constant move yourself, you have to constant reinvent yourself and um, you need to have an appetite for that, right? So uh, at some point you might get tired of all that change. In Berlin, we now are in the fifth office uh, within six years. Um, so this needs to be, you need to have an appetite there. And I think the challenge is this intercultural um, burden. Huh? We, we have an office in, in Rwanda, we have an office in Tanzania, we have now an office in Kenya, we have an office in China. So it's not only the, um, the time differences there, but as well just literally how people think and talk and you know, how you have to translate that to yourself and how you have to be very careful if you talk to your colleagues in, in other cultures. Um, very exciting, but as well very stressful because you know, when you're in a German culture and you have only Germans or Western Europeans around you, you can be very straightforward. You know what you talk uh, about, what you not talk about, and um, that I think are the challenges. Um, at the moment, we're in the middle of a Series C funding, pretty big funding. Um, How so much are you looking for? Um, 45 million um, dollars, and um, which will be probably happening. But for for us, then you know, the, the whole focus goes then into the financing round, and we have to be careful that we don't miss the, the operational game mm -hmm. as well. So if a CEO is for half a year blocked with looking or making potential investors happy, then that means half a year that the company is a little bit in um, not very tense mode, you know, and uh, I think that is where you have to be careful um, in, in the financing round and funding round that you don't lose your, your actual focus, you know, that you don't think, oh, now money is all the important thing and um, that you keep as well track of your daily business. <clears throat> Leo, how are you managing growth at Tado? You are now 100 people. Yeah, well, I mean, so it all um, started in 2010 when Chris was uh, spending a year abroad leaving uh, the university. And um, he was living in a flat share with a couple of Americans and they were fighting over, you know, um, should we let the AC run all day or not? And um, then they realized that more than a third of global energy consumption goes to heating and cooling in buildings. Um, and that was a pretty clear case. They, they looked at the tech behind that control and they said, okay, it's really ancient, outdated, we need to do something about that, let's solder together the first prototypes. And we were very small, very, um, very tiny, but what was very, very important at a very early stage was to have customers um, that um, put a lot of effort into giving feedback. So we spent um, nights and days in, in people's homes looking at how they use the heating system, um, installing these horrible little prototypes. Um, and now we are here having received uh, 20 million from our friends at Inven and need to put it into the right channel. So um, it's, um, it's crazy. You have so many um, dimensions um, between these years. You have organizational issues. You have a product, um, product to market fit issues, um, really making, I think, um, a product that people want, that people are willing to pay money for, is um, a whole different story compared to just making a technical solution for a problem that we came from, from the US, you know, with the ACs. Um, so I think that was, that was the biggest challenge in the beginning to, to um, get the product running and then finding um, a packaging for it, not the actual packaging, but you know, how you present it, how you position yourself, that people take the credit card and actually pay money for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then at some point, um, I think um, as you move down the classical like um, life cycle of crossing the chasm um, of new technologies, the channels that you put money in, they change with the target groups you want to reach. And we're now at a point where we kind of move into the early majority of, of people, um, which, is, um, which is nice, which we can only do because we put so much um, effort into the compatibility of our product. Because if you do TV advertising, for example, and the product can't be used by 50% of the people, then the spread is so big and the customer acquisition costs will go through the roof. So um, we always had a huge team, like at least five or six people in the beginning, just working on compatibility, we, making sure that the little commodity box of a smart thermostat can go anywhere, make any boiler smart, and then the actual music plays in the services and the app around that. Hmm. Thomas, uh, you have 100 people here in Berlin. Are they doing mainly what? The technical development, the management of the company, um, or do you also have uh, uh, technical people in Africa and developing a solution, a technical solution over there? Mm, actually, it's, it's a wild mix. So headquarters here in Berlin, but then we have <coughs> probably as well seven German engineers uh, in, in Tanzania, another two in, uh, in Rwanda. We need that feedback loop, you know, otherwise you're sitting here in Germany, the white engineer is doing something really great, what comes to their mind, but there's no connection uh, to the market, right, the product fit. And um, so it's, it's um, the whole um, financial, um, financial of the group uh, are meeting here in, in Berlin. We have management teams on the ground, but you know, we would like to have it as, as a group um, set up so that not every um, daughter company is inventing the wheel again. So everything is reporting to, towards Berlin. And um, yeah, firmware, software, I think we have by now nearly 20 software developers um, who are taking care of apps, of the database, and um, so it's, the, I think the interesting thing is that uh, a product like this was not existing before, so it's a complete new sector. Um, solar energy um, paid by, by loan in an off-grid uh, surrounding, so in rural Africa. So it was not that we could look at somebody else, at a competitor, and say, hey, they do it in green, we do it in, in red, because we think that red is the more attractive color. Everything needed to be um, understood first, and adjusted and that, that took us quite some time, quite some headache mm -hmm. and um, yeah, but with, with a team now of, of um, very dedicated um, colleagues that, that actually becomes a fun factor as well. I think, you know, asking for the pain of, of growth or starting, it's for me the biggest one is finding the right people. So um, from starting with two, going to, to ten, going to twenty, if you have a bad apple there, you know, it, it can start as well that other sort of good apples become rotten as well. Mm. So choosing the right people is for me, I think, the, the biggest challenge from a CEO uh, perspective to yeah, achieve what you want to achieve in such a fast growing um, surrounding. If you have, again, if you have one person in the team you can't rely on, it's like playing football. You'd rather play with 10 people than with 11 people if somebody can't stop the ball. And that, that is still an issue for us, huh, to, to grow that talent um, pool. I mean, being a founder and being still the CEO after so many years, I mean, it's a really big learning curve. Mm. Did you um, expect that one day you would be managing 500 people still as the CEO? What mm. is your secret? <laughs> <laughs> I think my, to my still be the boss. My secret is that I tell my wife always uh, another two years and then we will go move back to Australia where she's from. <laughs> I, I tell I tell <coughs> that since quite some time. I tell myself that as well for quite some time. So I actually, when we started, I thought that after one year we can sell off that, that business. Mm. I, I, you know, when we started, I was 28 years old, very naive. Now I'm 33 years old, still re relatively naive. Um, so that helps. Um, and um, I, have a, I have a clear exit plan for me. But that, again, is always moving by two years uh, in, in front of me. Um, I, I doubt that I will be the right person in, in two years uh, mm. to come for being a CEO of then a company with probably two, three thousand people, um, where I'm interested in, in quick and dirty and not in processes and uh, 100%. And I, yeah, from, I'm learning every, every week uh, a lot. Mm. And I think that is the most interesting for me to, to have that ability that so many things now come together. And um, um, I, I can be involved in many different points of the, the whole company. 
And how is it for you? Did you imagine to be one day managing 100 people and even finding them? In my dreams, <laughs> probably, but I would have never realized that this would, would, would happen in the end. Uh, but um, of course, mm -hmm. when you start up as an entrepreneur, um, uh, it's always the IPO you want to do, right? Um, and uh, who knows, we might even do it at some point. So uh, it's great to be here now. I think you kind of grow into the position. Um, you have to, there's no way around it. Um, but I think what you just said is really crucial that um, you need to find the right balance between um, building up processes that can actually facilitate uh, your growth, um, but not hindering you know, the ad, um, agile workflow that you had before. Uh, because when I look at, um, for example, the, the most important thing that, that we focus on every day is, is, is UX in the end. You know, the, the customer pays for an experience he gets with the product. And um, you can only maintain that or increase it um, if, if you have very agile product development cycles, of course. Um, and um, if, if for some reason the, the process structure would hinder that, I think we'd go bust in just a few, a few weeks. Um, so, and it's especially in the IoT, I mean, people expect the product to get better every day. Um, they expect free software updates. They expect new, new services. Um, I think it's, it's important to give it to them, and then it's important to find a business model to charge for that. Um, but you have to do it. And um, so that is something that we look at very closely. OK, what is the benefit of this process change, and does it actually slow us down? How much is the competition and, and what the competitors are doing relevant for, for your own daily decisions? I mean, for example, you in Africa, when you started, I think now there's a, a number of companies doing a similar model, and you are being copied by some other people. Selling PV systems online is, a, is now a, an idea everybody thinks it's, it's, it's standard. And even you guys have a couple of competitors. How big is competition a driver for you guys? Mm. For us, the competition started about one and a half years after we started. Um, and when I think the idea to sell PV is quite smart, <laughs> um, but selling it through utilities um, is an obvious thing for those who act with utilities, because um, they see that, that utilities are slow uh, moving, and if you give them a ready-to-use solution. Um, so today, we have about five competitors who do it who do the same approach, and the only way you can, um, uh, you can distinguish from these competitors is by fe being faster and exactly by, um, yeah, by telling yourself that done is better than, than perfect and, and getting things done, um, testing in the market, and then see what works and what doesn't. Um, if, you, if you are trying to get the perfect product out there too long, then someone else has done it. Because the idea itself is not something that you, um, you are the only one who had it. So yeah. execution of the idea in the fastest and still um, a decent way is very important, I think. Mm. Thomas, how is competition driving you or not driving you? Mm, I think competition helps to not get stuck in a comfort zone and um, to be, be forced to be innovative. And, um, looking at the, the competitors in, in our field, actually, it's, it's very nice. Um, with some, there's like a very good uh, relationship we have there. With others, not. But you know, there's you know, you get inspired by each other, and I think that is that is cool to think certain thoughts further then and adapt them to your business. And in the end, you know, we have to move to be as affordable as possible for our customer base. And um, so we are still not there yet where we have a product for 3 billion people. Hmm. You know, we are there where we may have a product for 3 million people. So we, we have, have 50,000 50, customers. We have by now 50, well, roughly 50,000 customers. Um, so there's quite some, some space uh, to go, to develop, to improve. So I think competition is uh, actually something um, very healthy to, to just develop them, um, ourselves. Which are the other um, markets in Africa that you would like to enter after Kenya? Um, <coughs> Nigeria is big uh, on, on our agenda. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the African context, Tanzania is a very friendly context. It's very relaxed. Nobody is too fast, too energetic. Then Kenya is uh, the next step, you know, where you have to be always quite cautious about uh, fraud, about this, that, and the other. And then you, I think, can go to, to Nigeria, where it's a different world. It uh, has nothing to do with what we have experienced so far. So far, it's, uh, it's a step-by-step -step approach toward the, 
the huge market of Nigeria. And Nigeria actually has an electrification rate of 60, 64%, but um, the, the real electrification is below 10%. And Nigeria has 25 million generators, small generators. And um, well, the mobile solar system is today already cheaper than, than such a generator. And so uh, then if you have the right team, if you have the right understanding of the market, it's actually going there and uh, attacking. Mm. Um, you, you have to be mature enough to do so. How important is a lot of capital for you guys to be faster than the competition? Well. Um, <coughs> I think capital is, is one of the main pillars. I, th I think it needs to come at the right time. Um, of course, if you go down the VC road, uh, you know, if you need, need cash, it needs to reflect um, your demands and it needs to reflect the, the valuation of the company. Um, and, um, you know, when, when, when Nest started um, a couple of years back, um, to be honest, we were very shocked in the, in, the, in the first moment when we saw the product. It's beautiful, you know. It's, it's, everybody um, thought the days uh, of Tado are counted, right? That's what everybody thought, that's <laughs> right. Um, and, and, then, and then the Google deal came and um, it was, it was um, there's a huge, you know, Goliath of, 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 of a competitor in the market. Um, but at the same time, it's also um, a nice proof of concept. And then we said, okay, this is our home turf, this is Europe, let's win this. Um, and really focus on, on making us compatible with all the um, you know, uh, European heating systems and being able to, to um, actually connect people and then being able to um, offer services from these interfaces that we connect to that Nest can't. And then we saw Nest is paying a huge amount for marketing. That's actually pretty nice. Um, so they are building up the category. Um, they're building up the category when marketing is still very expensive, you know, when, when, when the customer acquisition costs are very high. Um, so they've done a great job, you know, it's a great product. They've done huge PR and awareness campaigns. And that's super. And then now the moment came, we said the capital is right now for us to take because we have channels we can invest it in. We want to change um, uh, a few components of our business models that are very cash intensive for us, but that can uh, push penetration a lot higher. For example, offering the rent um, option for our smart thermostat, which um, no other competitor does at the moment. Uh, we have to send out advice with costs of goods sold, with customer acquisition costs but we only get like uh, 10 euros a month back. So it's really cash intensive, but you know, taking this kind of money enables us to do this kind of stuff. And mm. people love the RAM um, uh, model because they don't know if how it works, you know? Uh, they just want to try it out for one year, but then when they do, they don't churn, which is even better, you know? We have customer lifetimes of uh, higher than 10 years, um, which is, uh, it's, 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 it's just the right moment. So um, it's good to have it now. Thomas, are you spending a lot of money on marketing in Africa? How do you find these, uh, or how did, how did you find the 50,000 and how will you find the next 1 million? <clears throat> um, I think relatively to what you would spend on marketing here in Germany or Europe, it's, um, I, I just answered an email before I came on stage to have a huge screen at the airport of uh, Rwanda and it was for, I think, 800, or it was 1,000 uh, euros per month, uh, yeah, per month for showing um, I think 200 minutes every day. So I think you know that's and what you said. Yes. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I said yes. Uh, the World Economic <coughs> Forum coming to to Kigali um, this month, so everybody will arrive through that airport. Will see the mobile source screen. Um, it's you know I think you would pay that probably per per day if you would do it somewhere here in uh, in, in Germany. Um, but yeah, it becomes a more and more important thing for us as well to to build the mobile source brand to get the word out there. We made a a huge campaign last year in Rwanda, which we as well uh, continued in Tanzania, where you, for 50 cents a day, you can get um, power in, in your house, basically. So to compare it, you know, what is 50 cents? 50 cents is half a haircut. So we had a, an afro there, which was half shaved and half there. And to, to basically, yeah, underline how cheap it can be to actually mm. power your household. And, and your business mm. is also capital intensive because you are owning the asset on the roof, right? Or the, um, how does it exactly yeah, it's, work? It's a rent-to-own concept, so similar, um, where we have three years of um, payback period, mm -hmm. and uh, it's incredible um, uh, intense. Um, we had, uh, I think, $20 million, $22 million revenue last year. Um, we will pre-finance around, I think, $18 million of equipment this uh, year. Next year, it will be doubling. So it's, it's a huge amount of, of money you need for us the unfortunate um, detail happens is FX risk. So the Tanzanian shilling has lost last year 23%. So we wow. lost 
basically all of our profit line was gone by, by an FX risk or by an FX loss. So that was pretty heavy for us. And we have to manage uh, three years of Are you finance. hedging now in a way? We, are, we started hedging actually, yeah. and um, which yeah, is eating into our profits, but uh, is giving us the security that we are not uh, standing there again with um, a, a red zero actually by the end of the year. Mm. In, in your case, I, I always uh, wondered why you don't go directly to the consumer, but I think in the beginning you were really short of cash, right? And you, you had to go B2B well, in order to, to save marketing budgets. Yeah, I mean, we looked at <coughs> the American um, uh, business models, which is Sunjavity, Sunrun, Solar City, and mm. these guys. And then we looked at the market, and A, yes, we were short of cash <laughs> to do that, and B, it doesn't make sense to go directly to the end customer, because if you have uh, these regional brands, and if they let you um, use this regional brand, which we do by providing the portal to the utility, um, then why spend um, loads of money in, in marketing budget uh, if you have more than 1,000 utilities that already are with the customer? They have the, the typical region utility has like 80 to 95 percent of these customers in this region. Mm. Um, so uh, we thought this might be a smarter idea mm. than raising a lot of money. Even if we could raise that money, I don't think if it would have been best idea to spend it on marketing. We rather spend it on the product. Mm. So that was the idea. <clears throat> and Thomas, um, are you installing the systems um, on the customer premises? You have your own people riding there on the bicycle, as we saw yesterday. They're all employed by Mubisol, or do you have third-party par freelancers? Yeah. Um, they're not employed by Mubisol. They are commission-based paid. So mm. Um, they are trained. We have a Mobisol Academy um, wow. where we are training um, the staff basically because they are our face of the customer world. So we don't see our customers, right? Mm -hmm. They um, have contact with the sales agent, which is not on our payroll. They have contact with the installation technician, which is not on our payroll. So we have to be very concerned that um, if a customer meets uh, a Mobisol face, that you know, there's a, the good, uh, a good behavior and the right quality. And um, through modern technology, having apps, you know, where you have to make a picture of your installation. Um, we have a, um, a courtesy call 10 days after the system was installed. So we ensure that the, the right customer satisfaction is, uh, is given. But yeah, so I think the issue there as well, if you have installation, we have 400 uh, freelancers. So on top of the 500, another 400 freelancers. Um, they need to be motivated by themselves, right? By commission mm. that they go out and that they work hard. Mm. Um, if uh, they would be just on our payroll, we would have a huge overhead and um, yeah, would not survive. Mm. And uh, you don't need installers, right? Um, basically, the customer is um, mm. the installer. Yeah, that was the very early phase. Um, <coughs> I mean, okay. we, we designed the product um, to be um, a solution that you can self-install. And all of us in this room would be able to do so, of course. How many um, were able? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> How many turned out to be able? <laughs> yes, I, I mean, in Germany, the, the self-install rate is, is very high. It's, it's more than 90%. Uh, mm. It's a little um, lower in, in the UK because they have high-voltage systems, uh, for example. Um, but, I mean, uh, the, the more we move into the early majority, the more people will just not want to have to deal with it, you know? So we do offer it as a service um, to the consumer. Um, but there's a second side to it. So in the future, we want to um, be very close with the installers and, and we work on that a lot because um, there's more to offer from the installers. There's, um, for example, um, if you have a problem in the boiler, uh, we can send the error codes directly to a um, remote monitoring backend um, for the installer and he can check exactly what's going on with the boiler from, from afar and uh, take the right spare parts with them and um, you know, put them in the car. He only has to come once and fix it right away. Mm. In the app, um, the consumer sees a fixed price, he can just press a button and it's dealt with. You know, and you know, the, we want to make the heating boiler sexy, but it's not, it's not going to be um, the, the most desirable object you know, um, in your living room that you want to think about all the time. So having these services around that, that make it very comfortable to deal with it and just have your green check marks around it, I think that's what, what gives you a little bit of a goosebumps effect in the end. And how many installers are there in all the countries um, that, that you are dispatching, that are working with you already? So um, depending on the market, we work with, um, with, with um, like, you know, contractors that have you know, multiple installers. Um, we have our own database of installers, so we build up mm. um, several tracks to have them. Uh, for example, in, in um, 
In Germany, uh, we have about uh, 15 to 20 percent of all installers already signed up um, on, onto our system. The, the uh, Tato Professional program, it's, it's growing very nicely, so uh, we're on a good track. Okay. We are coming to an, to an end. Um, a final piece of advice from a big startup to a small startup sitting over there or maybe online that wants to go big. What is um, the key thing they should keep in mind? We start with you. Again. Um, <laughs> get the product right and get it out faster than the others. Mm. I think that's one of the key, key issues. If you think too long about whether it's right or not, you will not succeed. Okay. Thomas? Um, it's actually an, a nice question which you asked because I've been waiting since 2012 to answer that question. 2012, we applied for um, um, to be here on the conference. We were told we are not innovative enough. So, um, by me. <laughs> I don't know by whom actually it was. It uh, was me. Um, I think it's, it's even young can make mistakes. I think it's important. <laughs> I think it's important for a founder to to know when to exit. You know, to uh, if you really are on the right track or not. Um, you know, you get feedback from the outside, and you have to digest it. You have to understand is it a positive one or not. I think you have lots of founders who spend 10, 20 years on their idea, and they will. They should have better stopped after one or two years and have done something else and then um, excel. So, yeah, I think try to, to, to listen to yourself whether you're really on the right track. And um, but as well, don't get disappointed if other people don't think that you're on the right track. Um, I think that is yeah the, the little advice I have for for a founder. Okay, Leo. Yeah, I think I mean you said already that um, you need to ship. I think that's that's really important. Uh, I would I would also agree on that. Um, but if I had one advice, I'd probably say um, you need to put a ton more of weight onto um, the importance of sales in in your organization than you would think in the beginning. You know, people are in love with their little you know solution uh, problem solver, and they take the soldering iron out. And they they just love it when the LEDs go black and white and everything. But in the end, you need to sell this thing, and I think you should build up online competence in your organization, because if you do performance-oriented marketing in the very beginning, very iteratively, um, it's the best way to find out what the actual messaging is that you need to sell it um, to increase the conversion rates, to, to reduce churn. You need someone with online competence in the, in, the, um, in the firm who can try that out. For example, just make some banners, make some landing pages, put them online in Nigeria, um, wherever, um, <coughs> and just see if people sign up. And if they don't, change something before the product even exists, because otherwise um, it's going to be too late when the product's ready. All right. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for the panel. <laughs>